thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm going to be as brief as possible. I know there are four more presentations on the way. Um, um, yeah, um, I'm going to be talking about sovereign wealth funds in, um, in Africa and also uh, in, in the South African context. Um, it's, uh, I'm going to, it's going to be, um, a certain part of it is going to be the, a game theory analysis, common agency, principal, agents, principal agent theory. And then, uh, the, and then we're going to look at the theory and then see how it applies in the South African context. Uh, and then I'm also going to talk about case studies of Singapore and GCC countries and look at their experiences very briefly uh, as their experiences sort of confirm that, that, there is, that these funds can have significant development impact, uh, but they're also prone to political influence and these political risks have to be managed. Um, the, these funds are increasingly becoming popular in Africa uh, as the continent seeks alternative uh, ways to, uh, to manage their resource revenues, to boost economic growth, uh, and also to promote, their eco promote economic development. Um, they're primarily used for stabilization to cushion against uh, volatility, com the volatility, price volatilities of commodities, and they're also seen as an escape uh, from the so-called resource curse uh, in a region where discoveries of these valuable uh, commodities create um, conflict and corruption. Um, um, so the main objective is stabilization. The, the main objective of setting up these funds in the region has been stabilization. Uh, but increasingly, we, what we are seeing is that these funds have also assumed a development uh, role, almost acting, uh, almost acting like a development bank. Um, so I'm going to start with just a quick definition of what sovereign wealth fund is and uh, where their resources come from and then just look at some of the, the, the players in the sovereign wealth fund uh, universe. Uh, the defini by definition, they are state-owned um, uh, or controlled funds uh, which are created to, 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 from current account surpluses uh, when foreign exchange reserves are over and above what is deemed adequate. Um, and they, 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 and anything goes in terms of financial assets. They can be stocks, they can be bonds, they can hold real estate, uh, or any financial instrument. Um, and the, the, the resources are coming from two different sources, so that we can divide them into two, the commodity-based uh, sovereign wealth funds and then non-commodity-based uh, sovereign wealth funds. Commodity-based uh, ones are, the, are, are almost making up 60% of the whole sovereign wealth fund universe. And so these are oil, gas, mineral, uh, and other natural resource revenues, basically. And the non-commodity-based uh, sovereign wealth funds are any exchange reserves gained from exports, gold, pension investments, or privatization proceeds, or uh, raised tax, general tax proceeds. Um, these funds have been around for a considerable amount of time, especially uh, the ones in the Middle East have been around since 1950s, 60s. But recently, they have experienced rapid growth and also started to attract uh, quite a lot of attention. Uh, the globally, they amount to quite a big chunk of money. They amount to $5 trillion. And this is expected to double uh, in 2015. Uh, this is the OECD expectation to $10 trillion by 2015. Um, and uh, so they also attracted attention, uh, for instance, because during the financial crisis, uh, they, uh, it's, it's, they have spent $70 billion recapitalizing some Western banks during the financial crisis in 2007 and 8, uh, which created some sort of a debate about the motivations of these funds and whether they are just purely economic, they have an economic motivation, or whether there are some political motivations to be considered. Um, so when we look at this graph uh, to look at the, the wealth of sovereign wealth funds by region, uh, we, the Middle, East, Middle Eastern funds are leading the sovereign wealth fund universe, followed by um, Asia. And uh, African holdings of sovereign wealth funds are only at 3%. Uh, having said that, this is uh, likely to increase uh, and rise sharply with recent 
discoveries of oil and gas discoveries in, uh, in Africa, in East and West Africa. So this is going to give new opportunities for, um, for more African sovereign wealth funds uh, in the midterm. Um, if you look at, this is the table of the current uh, sovereign wealth funds in Africa. There are about 14 of them. Um, the largest ones are in Northern Africa, Libya, and um, in Algeria, uh, with the, uh, the, the $65 billion and $77 billion in total assets. To put them in perspective, um, the biggest sovereign wealth funds are the Norwegian Fund and also the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority, and their assets under management is around $600 billion. Um, but these are the big giant ones. Um, and, then, um, and then we have funds like uh, Angola, Ghana, and Nigeria that they have established sovereign wealth funds. And other players uh, such as Tanzania, Kenya, Sierra Leone, uh, Zambia, Uganda are talking about establishing uh, sovereign wealth funds on the back of uh, resource discoveries. Uh, South Africa is not on this, on this list, but uh, I'm going to talk about um, this uh, corporation, uh, PIC, Public Investment Corporation, Corporation of South Africa, which is um, as, which, which could be termed as a quasi or a de facto sovereign wealth fund, and we'll discuss their operations um, in a minute. Um, so um, these funds uh, are essentially, as I said, are set up to as an escape from resource curse. Uh, to so that the the idea is that the a well structured sovereign wealth fund is going to eliminate. Uh, inefficiency in, in resource wealth management and, and ensure less political inf interference and then bring a port professional approach to portfolio allocation and, and, and then so that the resources can be diversified into other critical sectors in the, in the economy as a whole so to boost uh, development in the region. Uh, but they come with uh, political risks attached, uh, and the success of an efficient sovereign wealth fund lies in how well it's been, uh, the, these political risks are managed. Uh, but before we launch into political economy issues around these funds, uh, let's take a look at this, the new mandate that these funds have been given uh, lately as a development tool. Um, a majority of um, Africa's sovereign wealth funds are established for the pu purpose of price and revenue stabilization. Uh, and over the, over the, over the past, year, past years, the continent has benefited from um, so-called twin trends. Uh, higher commodity prices coupled with rising production that have inflated government revenues and also fiscal discipline that also allowed greater savings. Um, so these research re resource rich American, uh, not American, African countries have accumulated significant excess reserves and these are um, more and more, more of them have gone in the way of ring fencing them in a sovereign wealth fund, uh, mainly to, for stabilization purposes. Um, but in the context of Africa or in many other developing countries, um, the sovereign wealth funds can have a, a much wider function than acting essentially as a savings account. Uh, they can have a more active uh, economic development role. And this is particularly the case in, um, in, in for, the, for the African region where you have uh, countries with rich in natural resources but subject to severe poverty and inequality. Uh, so the proceeds from a, a, from a natural resource can be set aside in a sovereign wealth fund and then channeled to the development needs of the country. So such funds are known as development funds. And the main difference between these development strategic sovereign wealth funds and the stabilization or saving sovereign wealth funds is, is that the strategic uh, or development funds evaluate the success so, so of most of their investment decisions, their projects, investments, not only pro from the perspective of a shareholder, so not in terms of pure returns, but also on, on their socioeconomic objectives. Um, so um, the, they can carry out this development role in many ways by investing uh, in key uh, sectors, in, in projects or firms, the priority firms in the country. Uh, by owning direct uh, control or not. Uh, they can also invest uh, in international companies to bring in uh, backward and forward linkages into the country, uh, so to enroll them more secu securely in the national development projects. Um, and some of the funds that are known to be doing this 
uh, the, the Singapore's Temasek Fund, New Zealand's uh, Superannuation Fund, Malaysia's Fund, and uh, most GCC funds are also mainly acting as a development, uh, they, they have a development mandate. Uh, this is uh, not a very clear uh, table, but it lists the other countries that also has a development mandate written in their uh, articles of agreement, so to speak, uh, and their, um, their uh, development mandate uh, activities. So um, going to the principal agent relationship, um, so how do we model this setup, uh, the decision of basically what we're trying to understand is what is the uh, outcome of a decision within in, with the, in the presence of domestic, domestic political constraints, how well a sovereign wealth fund that is owned by a government can decide on investments that's going to uh, promote development as opposed to creating um, disruptions or, promote, or, or, or rent seeking activities. Um, so we, um, so we, we borrow from interest groups, special interest group theory, um, and, um, and basically we're trying to, I'm going to try and be very brief as I know that there's the time's running out. So uh, what we're trying to do is we, we, we start uh, setting objective functions uh, and then with these objective functions we, we start with, with simplifying the whole uh, decision process uh, to a great degree. So we, we assume that the government is acting in its self-interest and, um, and trying to please. Um, so to a degree, it's interested in the welfare of the country, which is shown by why. And P is our decision, our investment decision. So where are these funds to be invested? And, um, and also, so they're trying to, the government is trying to maximize its, um, its welfare function. Uh, and the lambda is uh, essentially um, uh, an index between zero and one that shows how much the government cares about the country's welfare. And the other component is the contributions from coming from vested interests or interest groups uh, in an effort that, that the, in, the, in, in the theory they are lobbying the government for the decisions that's going to benefit themselves. Um, and then we have the objective function of the interest groups uh, and what they are trying to do is they're trying to maximize their function, uh, so maximizing their utility and, and, and given the contributions uh, to the government. So this contribution could be in sort of explicit or implicit, so it could be outright corruption or it could be political campaign um, campaign support. So we model, this is how we try and model a political, uh, politically uh, restrained government uh, in trying to make an investment decision um, when it's setting up a sovereign wealth fund. So we saw this game uh, with, by creating uh, first order conditions and it's a two stage game. Uh, basically the government is the agent with many principles, the principles being different interest groups. Also, um, you can model the, the country's citizens as one of the principles as well as the, the country, the, the government is also trying to get political support. They, they want to be re-elected, so there's an element of uh, caring for the government, uh, for the country's welfare. Why there? Because they want to be re-elected for their decisions. Um, so. The government is the agent with many principles, with opposing objectives, and it's trying to balance the, uh, the needs of these interest groups um, and, and trying to come up with a decision. So when you solve uh, the, the, the wealth functions of these countries, um, I'm not going to go into much details of the, 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 the mathematics, we find that there is a Nash equilibrium. If, if anyone is interested, I can give the mathematics section to those interested. And we saw for first order conditions and we show that we, we can show that, that the, our key result is that the interest groups marginal benefit from more distortions uh, to their benefit is equivalent to the increased cost of uh, payments for the additional distortion. So they will pay just as much as uh, the, in terms of campaign contributions or corruption uh, to the government, it's just so the, the truthful equilibrium that the, the payment is going to be just equal to uh, the utility they will get from this investment decision. Uh, the government won't be giving any more than that in, um, for this to work. Um, so I'm going to show you how this sort of setup 
played out in South Africa's Sovereign Wealth Fund decision. Um, uh, first, I'm going to talk about what happened. So the idea of a Sovereign Wealth Fund was sort of being on and off the agenda in South Africa for a while. It first came um, um, it, in 2010, uh, and then um, it was discussed and then put on the shelf and then came back into, on the agenda in 2012. And right now it's again, there's been cancelled as of May 2013. They've, so it's not again back on the agenda. Uh, but the reason it came on the agenda was the fund was going to be essentially funded by the, min, uh, by the, mineral, the mining industry. And the reason it's, it was proposed was that there was, there was increased calls for nationalization of the mines, of these mines. And the Congress uh, commissioned a report, and the report came with some recommendations to, to reform the mining sector in South Africa. And one of the suggestions was that setting up a sovereign wealth fund with increased taxation, 50% increase in taxation from the mining industry, and the proceeds going into a ring fund sovereign wealth fund. And the fund's um, investment portfolio was going to be divided into three. So again, the, the government, similar to this uh, political economy discussion we made, trying to balance the interests group. So we can talk about the interest group of the mining companies, so if, uh, and then we can talk about labor unions, for instance, who want the proceeds uh, from the, the mining taxation to, to be invested in the communities. Uh, on the other hand, the uh, mining industry, mining firms would want uh, an investment in the industry itself. So reflecting that um, special interest choices, uh, the, the proposal was that the development, the, the 40 percent of the proceeds would go into a mineral development fund, so being reinvested into the economy, and the 30 percent would go to go for development, so infrastructure activities, etc. So that would be the portion that will um, that the the sovereign wealth fund would spend on development, and the, the other 30 percent would uh, would act as a, a conventional stabilisation fund. Um, and uh, the idea didn't fly off. The, uh, mainly the treasurer didn't want to increase taxation, and also the, the mining industry uh, was never going to be happy with that 50% increase in taxation, essentially. Um, but what we have in South Africa, instead of this, is the, as I mentioned, is PIC, Public Investment Corporation, is a de facto sovereign wealth fund. Uh, and it is, um, it's, um, it's actually, um, it is a pension fund for government uh, offices, uh, but it, is, it has a mandate of, for development. So it is actually, it's a, it's a fund around $115 billion, and they do invest uh, a portion of uh, this um, assets in, in development. And as of 2010, they have also decided to, in, to invest the, the, part, the, the part of the the development money to be invested to be across Africa, so not only in South Africa, but also they've started investing in um, um, some other sectors in Africa, trying to create synergy. Uh, so, for instance, they are investing in um, cement sectors uh, in various countries. And because of the scale of the fund, the investment decisions they are making, uh, um, it's creating quite an impact in the whole um, in the whole continent. Uh, in fact, South Africa as a, as a whole, as with the BRICS discussion that we've just listened to, uh, f to my knowledge, it's the biggest uh, developing country investor in Africa uh, as a country ahead of China and India. Um, so this fund is acting, as I said, acting like a development fund. Um, and it does have it does and it does have the political uh, economy situations in its place as well. For instance, the on the board sits the it's the the, the, uh, the, uh, the finance minister sits on the board, and that sort of the decisions they make are of course not completely free of political interference. Um, to compare the, the uh, to, to sort of provide a comparative uh, approach, and I'm just going to quickly look into Singapore and GCC experiences. Uh, Singapore has Temasek, which invests, which is a development fund, and 30% of their assets are invested within the country. 
and the, the strategy is more outright, more, um, more clear in, in the case of Singapore and also of GCC. They try and invest in nascent industries and trying to diversify away from resource uh, based sectors into sectors, uh, especially innovative technology related sectors. In the case of GCC, they invest in aerospace, tourism areas. Um, but what we also see with the, the, those examples is that they are also not free from political interference. Um, what we see in, in the Singapore's case is that the family, uh, the, the Lee family, the ruling government, uh, is so entrenched in, um, in through the operations of Tamasak in the, in the country's um, economy. So a big portion of the economy is, um, is essentially governed, uh, owned by the government-owned companies uh, or the companies that Temasek has a majority stake in, so it's controlled by essentially the government. That creates, um, uh, for instance, the media is 100% owned by Temasek, um, uh, and so uh, and and the and the government, of course. Um, and the similar situation in GCC, and what that means is it's also one common thing between with Singapore and GCC countries uh, experience with these funds is that they bought small economies and with um, totalitarian regimes, or not totalitarian, but authority, you, know, auto, you know, they have authoritarian regimes. Uh, which might explain why they have a longer development horizon and then they can, um, in a way, their high returns and success in investing uh, in their sovereign wealth fund investments. Um, to conclude, um, South Africa experience can definitely borrow some positive lessons from uh, Singapore and GCC in terms of being more focused towards investments, um, uh, other trying to diversify away from the natural resources um, and creating a sort of a more conscious agenda for development. Um, and, um, and, and trying to insulate itself to set up an efficient sovereign wealth fund and trying to insulate itself from uh, political interference so it doesn't act like a bargaining tool um, and, and it, then it can promote for um, economic development. And operational independence of these funds is the key and to have an arm's length uh, distance between the government and the fund managers or the board of the fund is the key and of course transparency which is a big issue in the whole universe of sovereign wealth funds it's not something in terms of the, in terms of the numbers and the investments they make um, save for Norwegian uh, sovereign wealth fund we don't really have a great deal of transparency looking trying to look at the activities of these funds um, I'm going to conclude here and um, thank you very much for listening.